There's a lot of father and son duos that have played in the NBA, the Berries, the Currys, the Waltons. You are the first NBA player whose mother played in the WNBA. And I love your story because I just have this image of you in a bassinet, always surrounded by WNBA players with your mom. Do you still have lots of memories of those times when you were growing up like that? Um, yeah, I definitely have a lot of memories of, uh, I, of course, I don't have the memories of being in a stroller. I don't think any, anybody's memory <laughs> goes back that far. But I do have memories of when my mother was uh, playing for L.A., Sacramento, and when she was coaching for the Detroit Shot. What's that like, though, being surrounded by a bunch of female basketball players? You're asking a question from a person that wasn't surrounded by female basketball players. So as a person who was, I just thought that was normal. Do you ever play one-on-one -on -one with your mom? I used to when I was younger. I couldn't beat her until I was like 14. No way. Yeah. You have it just in your genes, right, this basketball. And there's a story that your mom, she was in her early 20s when she got pregnant with you. And she actually had an appointment because she wasn't sure if she was going to go through with the pregnancy. Your dad wasn't in the picture. And then she heard a pastor speak. And she canceled it. And then came you. What did she tell you about that decision and what she heard that day? Um, she just told me that it was God sent and heaven sent that I was supposed to be born. And she told me a story how I was like born with a basketball in my hand. But like it was like a ball in my hand when I was born. It was like, I don't know, the stuff that's in a woman's stomach when they're born, when the baby's born. But I was just like, yeah, okay. But it might be true. Or she might just be making it up to make it sound good. But that's my mother. I love her. Did that affect you at all, hearing that? It was uh, a pretty crazy story. It wasn't like... It wasn't like, I didn't hear it and it was like, oh man, I must be destined to play basketball. I didn't take it like that. I was just like, oh, that's a cool story. But now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, and I'm actually in the NBA. I'm actually doing great things in the NBA. It's kind of a cool story now. But when, it, when I heard it, no, it wasn't really interesting to me. What's the best piece of advice she's ever given you? She's always told me, like, it doesn't matter if you lose, win, fail, or whatever, as long as in the end of it, you were like, I tried my hardest, like I worked my hardest. I was in the gym, I was in the weight room, I was working my hardest, so you can't be mad at yourself at least. It was just wasn't meant to be. But if it happens and you worked hard, it's even more satisfying. You also try to stay really involved with your community. You're wearing the shirt for it right now. You're from Flint, Michigan. Yeah. First of all, how crazy is it that they're still having a water crisis? Extremely, extremely crazy. And it's just crazy that the, the America's worried about other things right now when there's a, literally a city in Michigan that doesn't have access to clean water. Like, it's a third world country. Does that make you angry? Yeah, it does. So how did you kind of come about Jug Life and why was it so important to you? Um, so I started Jug Life uh, as basically just a hashtag trying to influence people to drink more water. Um, I think it's like 80, 80 something percent of people in America don't get enough water that they actually need every day. And uh, obviously Flint, Michigan doesn't even have access to clean water. So that's even a crazy statistic if you think about it, just because we're in America, like the richest country in the world. Um, but I started just trying to get people to drink water, started posting on Instagram, me drinking a gallon a day, and people started doing it back. And then my uh, my business partner, Kez Reed, his uncle uh, is a philanthropist, but he travels around the world and just does like missions. So he goes to the Philippines, helps out, blah, blah. So he was in Uganda and he contacted Kez and was like, there's opportunity to build water wells out here um, because they have no access to clean water. It was a, it was a couple schools, um, students who were HIV infected and they the villages weren't letting them come to their water source just because they were afraid, I guess. So we found that opportunity and we were like, this is a great opportunity to help. And then that's what started the foundation part of Jug Life and we've been doing it ever since. In the past two years, I actually got to go to Uganda and see the natural water sources that they were drinking out of, which were cloudy white with infections and things like that. They wash up in there, the animals use the bathroom in there, guys are cleaning their bikes in there, Like it's, and then kids come with 20 gallon jugs and fill it, fill up the dirty water and bring it to their villages, basically just spreading disease. So just being able to help out with that was definitely one of the best things I feel, feel like I've done. Including basketball? Including basketball. So the JaVale McGee that you are now is not always 
who you were when you first started in the league, basketball-wise. Um, you struggled a bit in the beginning, and the media criticized you quite a bit. How much did that affect you? Um, I feel like it didn't affect me at first. Uh, it just affected me. It started to affect me when GMs and NBA coaches started to believe the things that the media or even like social media was portraying me to be. So what was the worst thing that you were hearing that was said about you? Uh, I was hearing things like I'm dumb, um, a bad basketball player, low IQ, um, an idiot. It's just it's a lot of things that, but I'm not the person that's like reading comments like, oh my God, I can't believe this because I really don't care. It's when a GM or owner of a team starts thinking that and they're like, no, we don't want to sign them because that's now uh, affecting my livelihood and how I pay my bills and how I feed my family. So that's when I was just like, it's last straw. Like, I don't, because I'm not really the person who's going back on people on Twitter. Like, right. Because those are people I don't know and never will meet. So when you say it was the last straw, what'd you do? Um, I mean, it was definitely just low lights being shown to me on TV. Uh, but it had came to the point where I was like missing a layup. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is on the show now. And I was just like, come on, man, everybody misses a layup, like a contested layup, like, come on, man. And I had to do what I had to do, and then it was canceled, and then I never was on a certain show again. You're talking about Shaq? Mm-hmm. Have you guys ever resolved that? No, but it's not really uh, something to resolve. I mean, he's in his own world, I'm in my own world, so it's not really a... And it's not really a beef, like when I see you, it's smoke type stuff, so no. <laughs>